Let me get some back onto Teams. To do an experiment in the morning, Mr. Connor, to see if um, the problem with my computer is being too close to uh, the live streaming, which I think it might be. Okay. Good. All right. Well, as con conscious of the time, I will move on to grounds two, three, and four. A couple of final points of grounds, if I may. Uh, first of all, uh, I'm sure the court has the point, but the uh, the, the fundamental objection we make in, in relation to the uh, impact on the competitive structure of the market is that in terms of the statutory regime, the, the, the merger powers, and particularly the interim measure powers in Section 72, uh, they are focused simply on the merger. And if the CMA wishes to regulate actions or agreements or conducts uh, and regulate the market more generally, that, in my submission, can only be done under other parts of the competition legislation. And in particular, part four of the 2002 Act is the market investigation power. That does allow some wider regulation of the market, but it is a distinct power from the merger powers in part three. <coughs> and we do say in particular that uh, unilateral actions taken by the acquirer, uh, even if they arise in the context of a merger, they are in principle subject to section 18 and Section 2 of the Competition Act, uh, and not to the merger powers in Part 3 of the 2002 Act. So there is a, there is a, a delicate construction within the statutory regime where uh, different powers uh, reside in different parts of the legislation. And the court has my point based on Ernest and Young, where the Court of Justice said, if you uh, increase the scope of the interim powers in merger regulation to engage in regulation of effects on the market more generally, even if irreversible, you uh, exceed the jurisdiction of the merger control and you reduce the jurisdiction of the other parts of the competition legislation. So I'll fall off on that. Uh, final point on tenor and um, <coughs> stickers. So the, the, the only concrete example that the CMA gives in the skeleton argument of uh, an impact on the competitive structure of the market uh, is the example of paragraph 44 in relation to tenor. Uh, now tenor is owned by Google, which is uh, of course hardly a, a poor grandmother. Uh, uh, Tenor has for some time also supplied gifts to Facebook. And the CMA says that it, it is concerned that Facebook might seek to terminate the Tenor relationship. And now it's unclear what the basis for this is. It seems to be no more than pure speculation. But we, we do find this claim utterly baffling because uh, Facebook told and committed to the CMA from the very outset that it would commit to not changing the Tenor relationship in any way. Can I, can I just show you the letter? It's in Supplemental Bundle, tab 21, page 350. In the unagreed bundle. No, supplemental bundle. Supplemental bundle. Tab 22, page uh, 350. Mm. Second, the IO would continue to apply to all Facebook's activities the right rate of supply of gifts and stickers, by very relation with parties in Facebook creation of gifts and stickers, by tenor. So, uh, so this is a letter dated 21st of July. So from a very early stage of the investigation, we had committed to the preservation in full of all relationships to do with the supply and procurement of gifts. And I show the court before the uh, lunchtime break, uh, paragraph 5D of the marked up IEO, where that is set out in black and white. So we did not seek a derogation. Uh, you will see from the amendment of paragraph 5D, everything to do with the procurement and supply of gifts and stickers would remain within the four walls of the IEO. Uh, so we don't understand uh, why the CMA continues to put forward this example. We had made this commitment uh, almost a year ago, and it stands today would stand if the derogations were granted. Uh, so th if, that, if, that, if that really is uh, the CMA's main or only example, uh, it is respect uh, clutching at straws. And to, to my Lord the Master of the Rolls point, that, that also, of course, covers the sticker store.
because the preservation of all things GIF uh, necessarily includes uh, the sticker store, which was uh, which is referred to expressly in the context of stickers. Um, so we, we, do, we, do, we had committed from a very early stage uh, to a very clear set of um, uh, commitments and objectives about all things GIF. Well, but what does what you have done in this case have to do with the interpretation of the statute? Well, it, 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 it is really more point for grounds three and four, uh, but it's simply to respond uh, to the tenor example, which keep, keeps coming up again and again. It might be said against you, the fact that you, you say that in this case you've agreed to that shows that, in fact, um, interim remedies can cover such matters, which are... Um, well, Lord, we, we, we had overcommitted in the sense, which is all, all the more baffling, to why the CMA um, continues to express uncertainty as to why tenor would not be protected. Why would you give a, why would you give a <coughs> commitment if there wasn't a power on, to make a, an interim order in relation? Well, it, it's to, to my Lord the Master of the Rolls point. Um, we, we were in the business of give and take, and we, we made a concession which went further than we say uh, strictly we needed to in an effort to try and um, resolve um, issues to do the derogation. So we went further, yes, your lordship's right, that we strictly needed to uh, to do so. Uh, can I now move on to grounds uh, two, two, three, and four, which are um, shorter and will, by necessity, given the time, uh, have to be short. Um, ground two is a, is a self-contained point. Um, so we made the point consistently that the, uh, the, the most extreme remedy available to the CMA would be a divestiture of uh, Giffy that was and remains fully open to the CMA uh, through the various uh, measures I've shown the court, the monitoring trustee, all central manager, and so on. And we submitted that Facebook could not order, the CMA could not order Facebook to divest both Giffy and assets from the Facebook camp. Uh, and that being so, uh, there's no lawful basis for imposing restrictions, restrictions on the Facebook side of the business uh, safe to prevent it from integrating with uh, Giphy, uh, which um, which would survive the, the derogation procedure. The, the logic of our position is clear. The acquisition changes the market by adding the target business to the acquirers. If the target is taken away by divesting it, then the status quo is restored. That, that eliminates the specific effect on the competitive structure of the merger. Now, from that starting point, the, the, the merging parties can obviously seek to bargain uh, down, for example, by offering a lesser divestiture package. But the key point is that CMA cannot go any further up. And this reflects a basic principle that the CMA could not direct a merger party to sell more than it has acquired. Uh, such a remedy would, uh, by its very nature, uh, be disproportionate and um, would breach the accepted causation requirement uh, for the merger specificity of merger remedies. Now, if I can ask the court quickly to turn to our skeleton, paragraph 65, just to remind the court of the, of, of the basis for, for that submission. This is the core bundle. This is 65 of your skeleton. My Lord, yes. <coughs> So we refer there to some case law, uh, the merger's guidance, uh, and so on. So that, that, that is the, the basis for that submission. Now, in first instance, we, we challenge the CMA uh, to identify a single case in more than 50 years of merger control where it had ever forced an acquiring party to divest its own assets rather than those of the target. Out of uh, literally thousands of decisions, CMA failed to do so, which we say speaks uh, volumes. Now, in a sense, it gets worse because the, the, the only case they alluded to as providing any possible support for their position uh, is the stagecoach case. And the court will see from paragraph 49D of their skeleton uh, that they now accept that stagecoach is not 
and I quote, on all fours with the present case. And so they've effectively abandoned the only case they said gave any remote support for their position. And they were wise to, to, to make that concession on Stagecoach, because as we pointed out in our skeleton, Stagecoach is a case from 2009, which predates the changes to the interim measure powers in 2013. Um, so uh, it's a completely different regime and uh, doesn't support the point at all. Now, what the CMA says is, uh, is somewhat elliptical. They say, and I quote, it, it is often the case that divestment of pre-existing parts of the acquired business uh, could be a more effective uh, remedy. So that's 49D uh, of the skeleton. Now, the CMA has, in fact, identified no actual case. But anyway, we suspect they're referring to a situation where the divestiture of the target business is proposed, but the merger parties talk the CMA down into a lesser remedy that involves divesting some of the target's assets and some of those of the acquirer. But this is simply a concession to the merging parties. Uh, what the CMA needs to do, but has not done, is identify a case where it has forced the acquiring party to sell its own assets uh, rather than the targets. And this particular point uh, emerges very clearly from the CMA's own uh, remedies guidance. If we go back to uh, my skeleton at 65.4, please, you'll see at the uh, bottom of the page there's a quotation from the merger remedies guidance. The CMA may be willing to leave open to the merger parties uh, which of the overlapping businesses they wish, uh, they wish to sell. So uh, it is a concession to the merger parties, uh, and that is the, the, the critical point. Uh, but certainly, uh, there is no obligation on the CMA to permit choir side divestiture. It is sufficient to divest the target uh, business. So the CMA may give a concession to the parties, but it, it is certainly not obliged to do so. Um, now, the CMA skeleton doesn't really engage at all on this point of principle. Uh, instead, the CMA's main point is a, is a rather vague argument that it has an obligation to act proportionately, and that it cannot fetter its discretion so on at 49D. Uh, this, in our respectful submission, misses two points. Uh, first, the obligation to act proportionately is for the benefit of the mer merger parties in the situation I've outlined. Uh, the CMA cannot rely on that principle, which is intended to benefit the merger parties at the final remedy stage, a concession, to justify what in this context would be a wholly disproportionate, detrimental intrusion at the interim stage. Uh, second, the fact that the CMA's legal powers are, are limited in this way does not amount to a fetter of discretion. The CMA has no discretion to apply a more burdensome remedy because that would exceed its legal powers. A public authority may well want, uh, for reasons of discretion, a wide margin of appreciation, but if for reasons of principle it does not have such a power, it does not assist it to say it would like to have. Uh, the only other point the CMA mentions in this context is that it, it may well propose uh, impose a behavioural remedy instead of a divestiture. Uh, this, of course, is trite. Uh, in any merger case that has not reached a final conclusion, in theory, a behavioural remedy is always possible. But it can possibly be the case that, that the mere poss possibility of a behavioural remedy justifies freezing everything, uh, everywhere, as the IEO does and the CMA has done. Uh, so this takes uh, matters no further. W what the CMA needs to do, and hasn't done, is explain how the granting of the particular derogations we seek uh, would, or might, uh, prevent a behavioural remedy in this case. Uh, it, hasn't, uh, it hasn't really engaged that question at all. Uh, I'll deal in reply submissions if they do engage, uh, but so far they have not. Uh, moving to ground uh, three, uh, ground three and four, in a sense, are linked, because they, they both uh, raise proportionality considerations. Uh, they go to slightly different points. Uh, ground three is that the, the refusal to grant the derogations from certain provisions of the IEO was disproportionate because the activity which the CMA was seeking to prevent is already uh, effectively covered by other provisions of the IEO. And ground four deals with uh, a point of principle as to whether in relation to the information request, the legal test should be one of rationality or proportionality. Now, starting with ground three, it is common ground the CMA must act 
proportionately when imposing interim measures. That is what its own interim measures guidance uh, says. Uh, that is one of the consequences of Article 1, uh, Protocol 1 of the Convention. Uh, the reasons why the CMA must act proportionately are, uh, in our submission, obvious. As this case shows, interim measures can place uh, severe restrictions on an undertaking's right to run its business as it wishes, in this case, globally. Uh, not only that, they, make, they may also reduce competition and innovation by stultifying the acquirer's business. Now, where the CMA chooses, as it has consistently uh, in the case of completed measures, to impose a blanket template IO on day one without even attempting to tailor it to the business in question or the nature of the markets in which it operates, the focus must quickly turn to derogations. And the CMA cannot avoid the duty to act proportionately by imposing a template IO and then reversing the burden on the undertaking to justify any derogations. The proportionality obligation is an ongoing one and we don't understand this to be in uh, fundamental dispute. Now, our point in ground three is, is a very simple one. Uh, the template IEO, as I showed the court before lunch, contains a detailed suite of restrictions designed specifically to prohibit preemptive action. If I can just ask the court to uh, get that to hand again. It's in core six, starting at one, five, uh, five. So we've, we've been through this once, so I can, I can take this um, pretty, pretty briskly. Um, so as, as the court will see, paragraph four, post derogation would remain. So my lord, I, I'm on page 156 here, at the back of tab six. Is the master of the rule tablet? Yeah. So paragraph four would remain basically intact. And the most obvious obligation under paragraph four, the main body, is not to do anything that would amount to preemptive action. That, that would remain fully intact. And of course, this more or less reproduces verbatim the, the statutory language. So it, it's comprehensive nature, cannot be in doubt. Uh, and as the court will see from the subparagraphs, uh, paragraph four is not expressed in purely bold terms. It is given specificity in the subparagraphs. So A is no further integration, uh, B, change of ownership, uh, and C, um, the ability to compete in any of the markets affected by the transaction. And again, all of that subject to one uh, change in paragraph 4b would remain intact if Facebook's derogation had been granted. Uh, the, in paragraph 5, there are then a series of further protections for the CMA. And again, as, as a matter of optics, if one looks at the red line, uh, most of it would remain unchanged. Uh, in particular, A, B, and C, uh, they would remain unchanged. Now, I would ask the court to note one important point, which I mentioned before lunch. In 4C of the IEO, you have the only provision in the entire IEO which makes any attempt to limit its scope to the markets affected by the transaction. By contrast, uh, all of paragraph 5 is completely untethered and is uh, indiscriminate in the sense that it applies to all activities and all markets uh, everywhere uh, in the world on its face. I mean, is this the template itself? Oh, I mean, yes. Does the template actually refer to the two merging businesses in the paragraph of 5C? Oh, yes. 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 So your complaint is against the template. Well, um, but well, it, I, shouldn't, I, I, it shouldn't stultify the uh, well, well, business. I think more, more precisely, it's, it's a decision to continue to apply the template. My Lord, on that point, they expressly did not challenge the template, the imposition of the template, and that's recorded in the judgment below, so that's not a challenge we're facing. Yeah, well, they are in effect challenging the template if they're saying that uh, it's completely wrong in principle to stultify the business of the acquiring company uh, because the template, template does have measures that affect the acquiring company's business. But, yeah. In respect of ground two, my Lord. So uh, subparagraphs 5A, A, B, and C are important because in addition to paragraph 4, they, they offer substantial protection to the CMA concerning Giphy. Then 5F, G, H, J, and L, they involve further significant protections 
for the CMA to ensure the viability and independence of GIFI. Uh, 5D would be amended. Uh, as, as the tribunal will see, we've agreed to uh, effectively preserve all things uh, GIF, also on the Facebook side, which is uh, my Lord Lord Justice Minister point. And 5E, the asset restrictions would only be removed on the Facebook side. Uh, 5I and K go together. Uh, we want a, a carve out only on the Facebook side in relation to employment matters. Now, th the reason I took you to this is that the CMA skeleton says if the only obligations which Facebook was subject to were those of paragraph four of the IEO, there's a significant risk and so on. But, but that is wrong because the bulk of paragraph five in relation to all of Giphy and much of Facebook would also remain the same. So that, 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 that is incorrect. So uh, our case is that the CMA, even post derogation, has very substantial protections against preemptive action in the provisions of the IEO we've just seen that would either remain wholly untouched or would be uh, only tweaked on the Facebook side. Now, that being the case, the need to also maintain the further provisions in paragraph 5, from which limited derogations were sought, was plainly disproportionate. And we say this in particular, this, this is my third time saying it, so third and last, because unlike paragraph 4c, none of the restrictions of paragraph 5 are expressed in terms of the markets affected by the merger. They apply in a completely indiscriminate manner to all of Facebook's activities uh, globally, irrespective of whether they have anything to do with Giphy, or indeed anything to do with the United Kingdom, or indeed the carrying on of business by a Facebook legal entity uh, in the United Kingdom. So if we take the example of key staff, uh, 5i and 5l require Facebook not to make changes to key staff, to take all reasonable steps to retain them. And what, what the CMA is clearly driving at here, which we understand, is that Facebook should not have a clear out of the key management within Giphy, and therefore reduce the prospect of a successful divestiture of Giphy at the end of the investigation. We, we understand that. But this concern is practically resolved by the provisions of paragraph 4, which would be retained, and by ensuring that paragraphs 5i and l would continue to apply in full to Giphy. And by contrast, if paragraphs 5i and L are left untouched in the IEO template form, on the CMA's original definition of key staff, this affects thousands and thousands of so-called key staff on the Facebook side. Uh, but the overwhelming majority uh, of these staff have absolutely nothing to do with GIFs or Giphy, as is now common ground. I showed the court before lunch uh, the provision of paragraph 35 of the letter of the 19th of February of this year, where the CMA has gone from thousands and thousands of staff on the key staff definition to something of the order of 100, so a 99% reduction uh, in the scope of key staff. But in, in its unamended form on the original definition, uh, this uh, particular restriction w was of, of global and uh, significant um, size. So w we say this is a classic case of using a sledgehammer to crack a nut. It would be a bit like um, being at a football match, and every time a penalty or a free kick was taken, uh, you'd have to evacuate uh, every uh, fan attending the game on the sort of scintilla of a chance that the, the ball might be booted up into the stand and might hit somebody on the head, that they would have to evacuate for 10 minutes and then stay away for a further period just in case the ball might drop down and hit somebody. And it, it, it is complete overkill. And you could say it's, it's similar to where um, a very lot wide order is made for disclosure of documents in the court of the, in the case, and it's subsequently determined that only some of those are relevant. So why, the original order was made very widely, so it can be considered whether they're relevant or not. And things, well, have moved, things have moved on sufficiently since the, since the tribunal's judgment. But see, you have now provided answers to some of the questions the CMA has asked as a consequence of which there's an indication of a willingness to, to narrow the scope of the, uh, of the IEO. Well, well, I'm going to come to that. We, we, we don't accept that as an accurate um, summary of what has happened. Um, but to, to my Lord's point, I mean, of course, it ties in with ground four, because if, if, if the test of the tribunal found is um, the, the question need only be not manifestly lacking reasonable foundation, uh, then that effectively is an abdication 
of any possibility of judicial review. At least in my law example, one can go to the court uh, on an ex parte or with, with a contested application and say, well, uh, I have some evidence which I'm now putting before the court, which puts beyond question that this goes too far. And the court will not be applying this manifestly unreasonable foundation test. You it would be applying common sense. But what you couldn't do is go to the court without any evidence and say, too wide. Well, I, I'm going to come to the evidence, but w w what I'm saying at this stage is that on the CMA's definition of key staff, thousands and thousands of people on the Facebook site were captured on the one hand, and on the other hand, the provisions of the IO which would be retained uh, fully protected all of the Giffy staff and had further protections in paragraph 4 and paragraph 5D in terms of the preservation of things to do with GIF. So that, 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 that is the hypothesis that, um, that, that, that we are challenging. Now, there is an upside down element to this IEO in the following sense, because if you go back to paragraph four, that is clearly focused on the integration of the target and ensuring Giffy's continued independence. And as you saw there, that, that is linked expressly only to the markets affected by the transaction. And then in paragraph five, which um, purports to be something uh, more specific, in fact, you have something which is much more general and indiscriminate, because all of the obligations of paragraph five apply to all of Facebook and Giphy everywhere. Uh, it, it is completely indiscriminate. There, there is no attempt to limit it in any way to anything to do with the merger or even the United Kingdom. And it's as if the I.O. was drafted by two completely different people uh, who never once spoke to each other. I don't think it's right to say that, that number five is, is expressed to be more specific because it starts further and without prejudice the generality. If, well, that, that's if, it, just, right. if it just said without prejudice the generality, I could I could see that point, but as, the, as it starts with further, that, that, that point doesn't work, does it? Well, uh, I'm responding to the tribunal's argument, which is uh, it is not appropriate for Facebook to say to the CMA, uh, you can rely on the um, fallback positions in paragraph four uh, in place of the specific provision in paragraph five. I say it's actually the other way around. One looks at it, and your lordship's right. The way paragraph five is, is drafted is, um, is by reference to paragraph four. In fact, it, it is paragraph five which is the blunderbuss. Paragraph four is the one which is very specific. So the tribunal got, got it backwards. I mean, you, you keep on saying that the entirety of Facebook's business is stultified by this order, and yet um, 5B specifically requires you. Uh, to maintain the Facebook business as a going concern, make sufficient resources available for its development on the basis of its pre-merger business plan. So it's obviously intended to be a temporary holding of the ring to stop you reacting to the merger in a way that changes the market with which they're dealing. And, I mean, what's wrong with that? That seems absolutely... Orthodox. Well, we're slightly jumping around, but uh, paragraph 5b would remain, and in my submission, that, that is all the more reason why the I mean, other. You're complaining about 5b as being, I mean, the, the, the point is that 5, I know you say 5b will, main, will be maintained, but it, it, it falsifies your main submission, which is that this is just some kind of blanket intention to stop Facebook trading. That's not what it is. Well, 5B is, is a basic provision which requires us to do something we wish to do anyway, which is maintain the company as a going concern. No, the, the, you're missing the point. On the basis, develop the business on the basis of its pre-merger business plan. So all it's saying is, this is a very temporary measure, if, you, if you'd collaborated with them. All it's saying is, don't do anything new in response to the merger until you've talked to us. I mean, that's, that's what it's attempting to achieve. Well, my Lord, it, it goes much, much further than that. The, the provisions on key staff involve thousands and thousands of people. I know, but you keep on saying on that, Mr. O'Donoghue, and I haven't stopped you. It's thousands and thousands, because Facebook is one of the largest global businesses in the world, right? But it wouldn't be thousands and thousands in any other case, and, and unfortunately, the business that Facebook has acquired here 
as, as I've pointed out and my Lord has pointed out, has tentacles throughout Facebook's very large business. So it's thousands and thousands until you've explained to them why the key staff are not relevant to this aspect of the business. And when you do that, you will no doubt be able to do whatever you like with this. Well, well stuff. I, I, I'll come to that. But the, uh, the, 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 the shift in ground has been dramatic. We have gone, as, uh, as I've shown you, Lord, from thousands and thousands of people to uh, about 20 to 40 people directly involved in gifts. Plus well, that's the whole point of the way the IEO works. You, you put on a blanket IEO, you take the risk by going ahead with a merger, knowing that this legislation exists, that nobody's suggesting there is no jurisdiction in the CMA. You take the risk, they put on a, a blanket IEO from which they are, and the, the tribunal is held, prepared to derogate reasonably once you give them further information. Now, what you're you seem to be challenging simply on the basis that Facebook is a very big company and is therefore different from a smaller company, which I don't understand. You know, whether it's thousands of, of people or tens of people doesn't make any difference. It's a big company, Facebook, so it has to consider its actions on the basis that if it takes actions without getting clearance from market from competition authorities around the world, it may uh, suffer greater problems, particularly if it's not prepared to negotiate um, as it should have done, which is what the tribunal found, it's going to suffer greater problems. But it's not a reason for questioning the premise. I mean, this is, this is a regime which applies to everybody, big or small. Well, well, be. well th th that is precisely the problem. But I mean, w one has to apply a bit of common sense. And it, it, in the real commercial world, the suggestion that uh, every product chain subject to a permission slip. That every change of key staff anywhere in the world is subject to permission slip. It's for the birds. It is obviously problematic, obviously disproportionate. Well, it's, and it's key. What, what, what it, it is, Mr. O'Donoghue, is key staff until you've shown they're nothing to do with Giphy and the acquisition of this. Well, my lord, it, it isn't. If one looks at the definition, let's, let's go back to the IO. If one looks at the definition of key staff in the IO, To page 160, it's staff in position of executive or managerial responsibility and or whose performance affects the viability of the business. Now, uh, it is expressed in, in the most general possible terms. And on, on its face, it, it is intended to apply, it was obvious it would apply, to thousands and thousands of people. And what the CMA should have done, what, what it has finally done um, recently, is not focus on the 100% of Facebook everywhere in the world and demand this ridiculous amount of information across the entire entity, but laser in on the GIF-related activities, which is really the 1%. That is what we have said from the outset. That is what they have finally started doing. I mean, if we can go to their letter of the... Just, just while you're on that, what does business mean? Well, it's, it's well, well, defined by reference to 129, section 129. Is it, does it mean the acquiring business or both businesses? Uh, well, it, 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 it must mean both, uh, both because the, yeah. the IO applies to both. Yeah. Okay. But, but, I, mean, I mean, this is gelatinous. I mean, what, is, what is managerial responsibility whose performance affects the viability of the business? I mean, I mean the, 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 this is about as vague, as vague as it gets. I mean, one of the criticisms made uh, of, of our suggestion on the ground three that the retained provisions would do the job is, well, uh, it, it's unclear. Now, we would make a series of points. First of all, it is no less clear than paragraph 4C, which refers to the markets affected by the transaction. Even today, nobody knows with finality what those are. And uh, virtually every provision of this IO requires interpretation and judgment. So the, the suggestion that the, uh, the fallback provisions of the IO, which would be retained, that they were somehow uh, problematic unclear that what was covered. What I find strange about this submission, if I may say so, Mr. O'Donoghue, is that you're saying that, well, you know, paragraph four and bits of paragraph five would do the job. But we're not engaged in an exercise of deciding which paragraphs can 
um, cater for the concerns of the CMA. That's, that is for the CMA. And you have a much higher um, problem in these proceedings. You have to show that the um, what they did, even if it was belt and braces, was wholly disproportional. I mean, that's probably why you use extravagant language about thousands of people the whole time. But, but actually, we can't descend into paragraph 5.3 and say 5.3c is a bit too much and 5.3b is OK, and it's duplicated slightly by 4.1c. You know, we can't do that exercise. You've got a much higher mountain to climb, haven't you, in judicial review? Well, Lord, uh, two points if I may. First of all, again, one has to apply a modicum of common sense. Uh, we, we, I'm good at that. Yeah. Uh, I, I know that. That's what, why I'm, I'm appealing to you. I mean, we're talking about 50,000 staff, 250 subsidiaries, activities virtually everywhere in the world. And the suggestion that every meaningful uh, business activity on the acquirer side, not, not just to do with gifts, must be subject to bi-monthly reporting, every non-trivial change uh, subject to this permission slip, involving proving a negative, is in my submission to the firm. And certainly, it is absurd and irrational, and certainly disproportionate, to suggest that if you retain the provisions which would be retained, and grant the limited derogations which we sought, that that would not constitute adequate protection. But the, the fundamental point I make here is that proportionality obviously involves a balance between two different things. And the problem with the tribunal's approach, and the CMAs, is that they see things all one way. Uh, The fundamental concern with paragraph 5 in its current form is that it applies indiscriminately to every activity of a meaningful nature everywhere in the world uh, on the Facebook site. Now, given the protections which would be retained post derogation, the effect of maintaining five, paragraph 5 in its unamended form involves a, an enormous restriction on commercial freedom, competition, and innovation uh, on a global scale. There is no doubt about that. And the, the defect in what the tribunal does is that it does, of course, consider preemptive action as it should, but at no stage does it factor into that assessment. Uh, the, the other side of the coin, which is the profound restriction on commercial freedom and competition that retaining paragraph four in its unamended form entails. So it, it is a unitary assessment, and that is a point of proportionality <coughs> that this court, in my respectful submission, can and should grapple with. It is linked with the point under Section 25.3, the promotion of competition. Uh, the tribunal simply left out of account uh, the other side of the coin, which was that in continuing to apply these indiscriminate provisions, it was distorting competition on a grand scale for a very lengthy period uh, on a global basis. The IEO is as a matter of Logic is far too broad, as the vast majority of the conduct that it restricts is simply irrelevant to the CMA's uh, narrow uh, merger aim. Now, can I, before we move on to ground four, I'm conscious of time, uh, can I just give the court a reference to the um, 19th century letter? It's in the uh, unagreed bundle, which I think now is the agreed unagreed bundle. Uh, tab 15, that's page 131 on my hard copy. So the, the court here, paragraph 23, so that this is the concept of gift related activity. So th th that is now the focus of the analysis of the derogations which remain outstanding. And um, CMA finally accepts in the second part of paragraph 23 uh, that the approach it has been applying historically uh, is not possible in this case. Now, before you launch it, it's put to me the point, well, that's because you've explained everything to them. 
No. The, the, the reason it has been not, not been possible in the present case, we've made this clear from the very, very outset, where, where we made crystal clear, if you seek to decouple this from GIF-related activities, because of the 50,000 staff, 250,000 subsidiaries, diverse activities globally, it will be impossible to comply with this. So you have to focus in on the GIF-related activities. And that is why we put forward in paragraph 5D, effectively a freeze on the GIF-related activities on our side, because that copper fastened the ability of the CMA to control the GIF-related activities, including on the Facebook side, while decoupling the rest of the business from uh, the restrictions in the IEO. And the CMA, after a year, has finally accepted that we were right to make that point. And it has nothing to do with information. It's essentially that they, they chose not to believe what we've been saying for the last year. And again, it, it is blindingly obvious. Facebook does not have a gift business. It gets gifts from Giphy. A de minimis proportion of users even use them. It is obvious if you use your brain and map that onto the organization that a fractional part of the Facebook organization can have anything to do with gifts. It's just common sense. And instead of focusing on that obvious point, CMA has spent the last year banging its head against the wall, saying to us, well, tell us about the other 99%. And the, pro the problem with that approach is obvious. I mean, we have, we have no difficulty giving uh, information in relation to gift related activities. This was our proposal. Uh, but what, what is a fundamental problem, what is obviously disproportionate, is having to give uh, the same information across the other 99%. And if it is the case, to, to, to my Lord the Chancellor's point, that the, the, the overlap of the margins in relation to some part of the 1% becomes a, a Trojan horse whereby the totality of, say, WhatsApp gets bunged up globally for 12 months of 18 months, uh, that, that is not a sensible use of merger control law and policy. It, it simply isn't. And indeed, just to wrap up on this point before I move to ground floor, which is a very short one, and it, it, it was the stage for many, many months that the CMA said to us, well, if there are any links between Facebook and Giphy, whether vertical, horizontal, or adjacent, you cannot get a derogation. Now, can I just show the court um, two of the letters? Now, the, they're in the supplemental bundle. First to tab 19. And it's uh, page uh, 312. What do these letters show? Well, it's, it's that the CMA said on, on a number of occasions, if there are any links between uh, Facebook and Giphy, vertical, horizontal, or adjacent, uh, we, we cannot grant a derogation. Of course, that set us up to fail, because it, it was common ground that there was at least a vertical link between Facebook and Giphy in the form of the pre-existing uh, contract for, for the supply of gifts. So if that was the test, then the first one is at page 312, the uh, 22nd of June, tab 19, the, the, the middle of the second paragraph, we would need to be satisfied that, that Facebook's activities are in any way related to Giphy's activities, whether vertically, horizontally, or in a otherwise adjacent market, would remain within the scope of the IEO. So to my Lord, the Chancellor's point, if that's right, then the entirety of Facebook's core services, which is the 99%, so that, that's would the, remain within the, the IEO. This is an incredibly early stage of the uh, of the of the picture. They've only just, you know, they've only just the twenty second of June, twenty twenty. Um, and, and it starts, if I may say so, with the words for the CMA to consent to remove Facebook yeah, entirely precisely. from the scope of certain provisions. Then we need to be satisfied that there wasn't any horizontal, uh, vertical, or otherwise adjacent market seems to me to be entirely reasonable in the circumstances, given the state of the, the asymmetry in knowledge as at that stage. 
Well, I mean, you're plucking individual paragraphs and individual letters at different times. Um, speaking for myself, I just don't see what where this gets you in relation to your ground three, which I think you're still on ground three. Oh, yes. Um, well, let's go on to tab 31. And, um, several weeks later, the same point is repeated. Well, so, 2nd of July 2020, still very early. 19B. What page? Uh, 3.30. Now, it is fair to point out, the tribunal uh, said, um, well, we, 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 we don't think the CMA uh, re really intended that or meant that. Uh, but I, I pick you up on a point, my lord, the master of the rules uh, for uh, the interim measures of the IO, and I just want to make sure the court has the point. I'm sure it does. If, if that is the test which the tribunal rejected, uh, then it would have the consequence that we would never get a derogation because there was an admitted vertical link between Giphy and Facebook, uh, pre-existing from 2015. Well, I mean, you just can't talk about never get a derogation. I mean, there are, it's, it's a complex picture, and you're going to get some derogations and not others, depending on the type of link. Well, my lord, again, the, the start the, of fact... The, the first three sentences of paragraph 19b seem to me, at the early stage of an investigation, to be entirely unexceptionable. Cautious about granting derogations uh, at an early stage. Wouldn't consent to remove, uh, again, as my Lord said, there's, it's saying we would consent if we, ha if we had these assurances. And the CMA does not have the necessary information at this stage of this investigation to make such a determination. Well, Lord, in relation to the second letter, on the... Uh, 2nd of July, which predates this letter, uh, we had provided a 100-page merger notification to the CMA. So I, I don't accept at this stage that they were, they were in the dark. And the, the fundamental point remains, I mean, once you understand, which was made clear in this merger notification, that 1% of users uh, even bother to use GIFs, then anyone with a, a bit of wit will understand straight away that the focus must shift to the 1%. And instead of doing that, we've had the last year of the CMA banging on about the 99%. Then as we saw on the 19th of February, the penny has finally dropped that actually we should be focusing on the 1%. And that, that is why the information requests in my respectful submission are a red herring. Because the CMA has, in its 19th of February letter, now effectively abandoned seeking all of the information it spent the last year um, ob obtaining from us. Mr. Tomihi, in praying aid, what's said in the 19th of February 2021, wouldn't one have to take into account what was what you said to them, which appears in paragraph one of the letter, on the 11th yeah. of December, 18th of December, and 15th of January? Yeah. Um, and um, we go. We need to go and go into a detailed analysis of exactly what you told them when and its impact. Uh, 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 and. It, 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 indeed, we might even need to have further evidence from from the CMA as to as to why it had acted in the way in which it did, uh, if if we were to give any credence to you, the criticisms that you now make in a very broad way about the approach of the CMA uh, in its in this letter in February 2021, that it somehow abandoned its position in relation to your um, thousands of employees. And, and what is more, Mr. Donoghue, you are completely ignoring the cat's judgment. Yeah. The decision in paragraphs 100 and, I don't know, 160 and following, no, 160 and following, yeah, where yeah. they deal with all this yeah. and say it was all your fault. Right. And that was findings of, of, of fact on the correspondence which they went through. Well, Lord, the CMA has chosen to put in all this post judgment material. I'm relying on the post judgment material to show that they have abandoned uh, seeking the information they insisted on for the last year. And therefore, so the information is a red herring. This is all, this falsified what the tribunal said. Well, it certainly neutralised it. But it, it was aimed at the wrong target. And they should have been focused on gift-related activities from the outset, and they didn't. OK. And, 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 and that is a direct function, if I may say so, of this template approach, this rigid adherence to, to a checklist, and not thinking about the transaction at hand. 
You didn't criticise the um, the use of the template uh, before the cap, did you? Uh, well, uh, not in the sense of its initial imposition, uh, but in the sense that in refusing derogations, it is also a decision to maintain uh, the provisions of the IO uh, in their current form. So yes. it's, it's two sides of the same coin. Yeah. If, if, um, if, if, if you don't object to the initial imposition of the template, but then you don't provide any of the information requested, what, what grounds have you got to complain? Well, uh, I'm on grounds three and four, which are proportionality of the point. Uh, but, fine. But the propor pro proportionality must take into account factors such as the uh, cooperation and compliance of the merging party. Well, yes, but it, it is a two-way street. And what, in my submission, what one should not do is simply apply the template and this checklist of information. One has to focus in on the parties and transaction at hand. And the CMA <coughs> was insisting at that stage, has insisted until the 19th of February, that we need to know everything about the 99%. They're now focusing on the 1%. But that, that's what they should have been doing from the outset. Because from our perspective, if the entirety of the core services is, is gummed up because of the one percent. That is a you should, fundamental you commercial problem. Decision? From the outset, if they didn't know anything about the extent to which the tentacles reached in, into your business, which was but, uh, both Master and Royals and I may do, they they had no way of knowing that at the outset. But my lord, it if, may be that if we were to spend three days or five days or whatever, which we haven't got on this appeal, and we were a court, of, a, a, we were the cat and not the court of appeal, we could analyse all this material and reach some conclusion. Uh, as to whether or not um, the CMA the position as it now was was a position that it should have adopted earlier for, for all sorts of detailed reasons. But that's none of the purpose of this court, nor for that matter the purpose of judicial review before the CAP. Well, the, the court has my, my key points. Uh, th they were certainly aware by early July that about 1% of the refusals were affected. Th that, that should have been their starting point. And they were aware that there were 50,000 employees. They were aware there were hundreds of subsidiaries. That there were thousands of key staff affected. And at that stage, they should have focused only on the gift-related activity instead of focusing on the entirety of the whole business on a global basis uh, for the next year. Mm -hmm. I do give the call a final reference before I quickly do the ground four. It's a supplemental bundle to tab 24. Well, it's at 398. So this is a letter dated uh, the 25th of August. I've got Annex 1. Well, yeah, so um, it's, it's to my Lord the Chancellor's point. Well, uh, it, it was early days and they didn't know very much. Uh, here is the list of all the submissions by this stage we had made. Uh, including, of course, the draft merger notification, uh, which is a 100-page document plus exhibits. So we do not accept, certainly by... Um, I notice your draft merger notice, which you referred to already, was actually sent the day after the last letter you showed us. Well, well, I, I apologise. I thought it was the day before. So that's I, a false point, isn't it? Uh, it was the day after. Anyway, my lords, certainly by August, uh, the CMA was uh, well informed and um, had, had plenty of material uh, to deal with. And I mean, just by way of comparison, the, the statutory deadlines for phase one are, are 40 days. By the time we got to the CAT hearing, <coughs> it had been four months. Um, so th 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 there was a lot of water under the bridge. Um, so we, we, don't, we don't accept this asymmetry certainly by the time uh, one gets to uh, August and the, uh, the CAD ruling. Um, finally, then turning to ground four, I'm conscious that Mr. Dimitrio must be given a fair crack at this. Uh, ground four is a, is a very short point of uh, principle. So the, the 
court has the point that in paragraph 154, the tribunal said, unless the information requested by the CMA is so manifestly without reasonable foundation, uh, it is not the tribunal to second guess. So the, 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 the legal test they set out is uh, manifestly without uh, reasonable foundation. And the court will see at 154 that they relied on the uh, British Airports Authority case for this purpose, and in particular paragraph 20, so paragraph 5 of that judgment. And the CMA paragraph 58 of its skeleton essentially adopts um, the tribunal's uh, reasoning. And its, its position appears to be that while uh, Article 1, Protocol 1 of proportionality is engaged, and the proportionality standard applies, all that it requires in the specific context of requesting further information is that the information requests uh, appear to be rational. That's paragraph 58B. Uh, uh, so th th this really stands or falls on the VAA case or, or on the principle um, which arises out of that case. So on VAA, uh, we, we say the tribunal has made an error of principle and was wrong to apply the rationality test that it did. I just ask the court to turn up the judgment because authority is one tab seven. My Lord, it starts at 299 of electronic bundle. Um, so the, the, the first point is that the judgment, of course, is the judgment of the CAT, which is, which is not binding on this court. And um, if the court can then turn to paragraph 20, subparagraph 3 of, of the judgment itself. Subparagraph three? Uh, five, sorry. Five. five. And it's at the end. So the court says even if the standards required of the Competition Commission were more stringent than the usual test of rationality, the CC would plainly have met these more stringent standards as well. So, so the, the, the point was arbitrary. So, so two points, not, not binding on you, arbitrary in any event. They're, they're not, not my main point. Um, the second point is the tribunal's reasoning on BAA is with respect uh, thoroughly confused. Because in, in one part of the judgment they say, relying on BAA, that the test is whether the request is manifestly without reasonable foundation. That's 154. Sorry, you, you, I'm, I'm not quite sure I'm on the right yeah. paragraph. Is this page 311? 312, my lord. Continues over the page. 311. Subparagraph 5. It's, it's the end of subparagraph 5. It's the end of subparagraph 5. Yes. That's why I didn't find it. Which, which line on uh, the page? It says, three? however, we also accept. How many lines down? Uh, it's six lines from, from the end of sub, subparagraph 5. Oh, got it. Thank you. At the very end, my lord, the last, the last full sentence. However, yeah, no, I got it. Thank you. Um, so the, so the, the point was arbitrary. It's, it's what you get from that. Well, not specifically making any decision at all. No. no. Well, well that, that, that's one of the points I come to. In fact, um, it, it didn't arise for the reason I will come to in. It's a, it's a, it, this is a, a judgment which sets out a series of principles yeah. to be applied. So whether it's ratio or robot a series of principles that set out by Mr. Justice Sales, who then was the chairman of the CAT. Um, I'm speaking for myself, what I would have thought was um, should be accorded great respect. Well, yes, of course. Well, I'm, I'm just giving the court the context. Um, it, it obviously isn't binding on you. Right. Um, that, that's the first point. Now, the second point is that the tribunal's reasoning seems uh, confused. So, at, at one five, so this is the tribunal's judgment. This case. So, paragraph not one. Mr. Five, Justice Sales. No, my lord, in, in no. our case, yes. It's, uh, we're back to no. Mr. Bright. 155. 155. So, so, there they say it's the test is manifested without reasonable foundation. And then at 148, they say the domestic standard rationality is flexible 
can be adjusted to take into account proportionality. And it's, that seems to go around um, in, in circles. Why does it go around in circles? That's exactly what Mr. Dale says in subparagraph 5. Higher up the page, he says, um, one may compare in this regard the similar standard of review of assessments of expert bodies in proportionality analysis under EU law, where a court will only check to see that an act taken by such a body is, is not vitiated by a manifest error or misuse of powers. So there's a manifest error point. Accordingly, in the present context, the standard of review appropriate under A1P1 is essentially equivalent to that given by the ordinary domestic standard of rationality. So he's simply equating the two. And that's exactly what this tribunal has done. Well, well th th there is a distinction between a final substantive decision, which, which is one of the points I would come to, uh, and this case, which is where no decision at all has been taken. Um, but I I'll develop that shortly. Um, the, the third point is that the, the, the word manifestly, as, as you can see from being It is based on the James versus United Kingdom uh, judgment of the, of the Human Rights Court. I'm sorry, you lost me now. Where are you looking at? Um, we're, we're back in BAA. Yes. Well, which paragraph? I think we're still in sub five. That's the reference to James. Yeah. Um, paragraphs 46 and 51. Um, but if we then go to James, which is in tab 18, I'm afraid that's the second bundle. Which page? Paragraph 46. And the the, the court will see the bottom of page one thousand as a reference to unless that judgment it can be manifestly without reasonable foundation. Mm. Court see that? Well, it's tab eighteen on the second. Yeah, yeah. It's well, also chance. No, I. Right. James. James. So you see the bottom of the page manifesting that reason foundation. Yeah. But if one looks at the start of 46, I mean, what this is concerned with is margin appreciation that the Strasbourg Court applies as a matter of international law when reviewing uh, national decisions. And we're not, not concerned here with an international court reviewing a national decision. And indeed, indeed, the tribunal in this case is the first national body to review the decision. And the concern we have with a test based on manifestly without reasonable foundation is that it would make the CMA a judge in its own cause. And it would involve a, an abdication of, of uh, any judicial uh, control on the part of the tribunal. Well, I mean, the, 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 as I pointed out to you this morning, section 72.2 makes it very clear that it, that the statute has made the application of this test something for the CMA's consideration. Well, well in the first instance, of course, that, that's because they're the decision makers. Yes, but then once the, we're reviewing a decision, we're reviewing it on normal judicial review principles, which, which require that um, something has gone wrong. In other words, there must be a legal error, or there must be failed to take into account something that should have been taken into account, or there must be etc. Mm -hmm. et cetera. You know it as well as I do. Yeah. Well, we, we, we're dealing now with the point of principle as to... So, so what, if you say that, that the test is not um, manifestly, when they're asking for information, not manifestly without reasonable foundation, what is it? Well, it, it, it is normal proportionality, which is... What it must be, so this court has to decide has to go through, or the CAD, has to go through each question they ask and say, is this proportional, understanding the entire factual scenario that the 
CMA is dealing with. I mean, that's not the normal way this the, the CMA is regulated. Well, you're right, because the CMA is the decision maker. I mean, the CMA is the decision maker. You have to show it was, was just wrong. And, and not, not that um, you know, it has to be second guessed in every sub paragraph. It's why I balked when you were going through the, the, um, the, the um, interim enforcement order itself. Because we can't do that. I mean, it may, it may be in your defense, Mr. O'Donoghue, it may be why you, you opened the case as you did this morning. Because you, you wanted us and you want us to say that this is manifestly without reason because it was all quite disproportionate, obviously disproportionate because it was only 1% of Facebook's business, it was self supplying the entirety of the rest of the business and all the points you've made repeatedly during the day. Well, well, but I mean, I don't understand how you can say that we have to go through every um, request and question it, second guess it. Surely the tribunal would say, right, to say that we didn't have to do that. Well, if I can put this point slightly different. So the, 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 there is a point of principle, which is that the one I've made, which is the court can certainly form a global opinion as to whether uh, focusing on the yeah. 99% rather than mm -hmm. 1% that makes any sense. In my submission I think it plainly doesn't. But I mean, what, one has to look at the consequences of the derogations not being granted. And the consequence is that all meaningful commercial activity globally is, is hindered. And innovation are hindered. Mm. And, it, and, it, and it must, at least in that context, be incumbent on the CMA to explain that why, if they have uh, the retained provisions of the IEO, the derogated provisions are essential, uh, bearing in mind the impact on competition of maintaining the underdelegated provisions in their current form. And uh, in that context, uh, the CMA's demands for information must be seen. Because it, it, it is obvious that if, if, if the test is, well, can you come up with a rational question, um, they can ask questions until the cows come home. And the, the, the problem with a manifestly without reasonable foundation test is that we, we then end up with a state of affairs where it's, it's ipse dixit. So long as a, a question is asked that doesn't seem crazy, this can go on ad nauseum. And that is a recipe for capriciousness and abuse. And I, and I do repeat the fact. Well, that is your, your if, you, if, I, if, if you like, your primary submission. I mean, we, we, we got a bit irritable with you this morning when you were making that point. But what you're really saying, I think, in, under every head, is this was just over the top, completely disproportionate, and irrational, uh, because we were dealing with the integration of a very, very small business into a very, very large business. As you say, it would potentially have an impact on competition in the wider market. Yes, well, well if one looks at these two cardinals, on, on the one hand, we have all of Facebook's competitive and innovative activities everywhere in the world being bombed yeah. up. Well, we've got the global part. Global, we've got that in space. Then on the other hand, you've got this 1% that on, on any yeah. rational has tangible and small limits. And if, if one is looking at these two things, in my submission, it, it, it is absurd to suggest you must bung up the 99% for a scintilla of a chance that something might happen to the 1%, particularly when all of the retained protections in the IO, which I've outlined, would remain in force. I mean, one has to apply the modicum of common sense. But that's, you've said that several times. And yeah. the, the merger control process is simply intend, intended to control Mergers. It is not intended to regulate markets You've everywhere in the several world. Times too, there are other competition that. powers which do that job, uh, and they are not uh, in the merger sphere. Now, a couple of final points of view here. I'm, I'm, um, I have on the run. I'm sorry. Um, before you, in relation to the passage you showed us in 25, though, um, 20 sub paragraph 5, the, the, the key passage and the one referred to by uh, the tribunal is in 20, paragraph 3, isn't it, at the bottom of page 310. 
where there is an express finding that the standard to be applied um, in judging the steps taken by the CC in carrying forward its investigation, for its opposition, property decide the statutory question is a rationality test, and it cites other authorities in support of that. So that that's the that's the authority as to the test. And the passage at the end of twenty to paragraph five is saying, well, even if it was more stringent than that, it would have been met. Yes, that's all. Well, yes, but one has to then go on to paragraph sixty and sixty-one because the, I mean, the, the first thing about BAA, of course, that it is not a merger case. Uh, you, could, you could see from paragraph three of the judgment that it was concerned with sections one three seven and one three nine of the Act. It was about a uh, market feature leading to an adverse effect on competition. So it's not a merger case. Um, but the critical point in response to my lord, uh, Lord Justice Phillips, is it was a very straightforward case. So BAA owned four of the five airports in London. They didn't compete. Uh, in 2009, it was ordered to break them up and sell Stansted. Uh, they ran uh, a, an optimistic challenge of bias and they failed before this court. And then in 2011, the Competition Commission readopted the same decision. So it, it was a, a final substantive decision identifying an adverse effect on competition and requiring the divestiture of Stansted. Now, in that context, BAA's second crack at the whip was to say, well, uh, notwithstanding your substantive conclusion, which we don't challenge, uh, we think you had a duty to go out and get even more information to try and uh, justify uh, your decision. So that is the point of paragraphs 60 and 61 that the court is dealing with. And we can just quickly turn to those, and then I, then I will sit down, I promise. Um, so it's at 60 and 61 of the judgment. See at 60, there was, there, was no, there was no challenge to the point that the AEC identified in 2009 had ceased to, exist, ceased to exist in any significant way. So this is a bit of a nothing point, where the VA was not challenging the ultimate conclusion, it was saying, well, you could have, had a, could have got a bit more information. Now, that, of course, was, uh, was hopeless. And you see at 62, this provides a convenient basis for the analysis of the other points made by Mr. Green, as he then was. Uh, underground one, and then at 63 for belt and braces. Well, by the way, they, they did investigate. Um, so th this was really a bit of a no-brainer. There was no challenge to the fundamental conclusion as there was in AEC, and blindingly obvious. So it is very hard to see from this case where the point about gathering even more information went. There's no suggestion in particular would have led to a different conclusion. And but why does that affect what the test is? Well, the, the issue in this case is not whether the CMA had gathered enough information to justify a final substantive decision it had taken. The issue is whether uh, it hadn't taken a decision at all. And what is the standard to be applied as to whether uh, what information it needs in that context? Forgive me, I asked the same question. Why does any of that get well, it, In BAA, the, the standard review that applies where a party is challenging a final substantive decision uh, involves an allegation that the merger authority didn't gather enough information. Whereas in the present case, the CMA is using a reported lack of information uh, as the basis to not take a decision. Right. But why does that change? Well, in the former case, my lord, the authority uses whatever information it has at its disposal to reach a decision that is in itself amenable to challenge. And one can see why in that context the tri tribunal would say that where the decision itself survives challenge, which is paragraph 60, there's a very high hurdle for showing that nonetheless the authority should gathered even more information. But in a case like ours, where there is no reasoned decision at all, and the authority can use repeated information requests to delay essentially indefinitely if the tests have manifested without even a foundation uh, to the detriment of the party seeking that decision, uh, we say that that is a uh, fundamentally different situation. And final point, I will sit down. Of course, uh, there is a statutory requirement in section 72.7 of the CMA consider derogations uh, requests as soon as reasonably practical. So there, there, there may be a trade-off between efficiency and speed and needing to obtain 
that there'd be some information. Uh, and this was not a, a point which, uh, which arises in the EAA. So what you're saying is that so when considering whether or not a decision not to ask for more information, that's a rationality test. But a decision to ask for information is a proportionality test. Well, yes. Well, I in particular, where there's a statutory requirement to consider this in, in an efficient manner. So that, that is why we say in ground four that there is a point of principle to, to be decided. Well, those, those are my submissions. Thank you very much. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Meacham. May it please the court, I'm going to start by summarising the gist of our response. Oh, gosh. Ah. Let me try again. I think that's better. That's better. Um, I'm going to start by summarising the gist of our response to this appeal, and then I'm going to turn to the legislation. Um, I'm then going to make some, some submissions about the factual context in which the, the tribunal dismissed Facebook's application. And then I hope at the end, um, relatively efficiently, just to draw those submissions together and respond to the, the grounds that are advanced. Um, it's necessary in my submission in this appeal to focus on the position that was before the tribunal and on what was really going on at that stage. And in summary, um, as, as the court has seen, Facebook had already merged with Giphy and integration steps had already taken place. And in completed mergers, as you've apprehended, the imposition of an, in, an initial enforcement order is very important because otherwise the merger process could be preempted. And that's why the CMA's powers to impose an IEO are of a precautionary nature and they're broad. And it's also why the CMA needs to act quickly. Um, and at the start of a merger inquiry, the CMA will have very little information about the merging businesses and how those businesses operate. There is, in other words, as we've said in our skeleton argument, a profound informational asymmetry between the CMA and the merging parties. And so in those circumstances, the way that the CMA generally proceeds and the way in which it proceeded in this case is to impose a template, the template IEO, with a view to then cooperating with the parties to grant derogations. And the template IEO has been drafted in a manner which is apt to stop the types of possibly preemptive action that might typically take place when parties have merged already. But in order to grant derogations, the CMA needs information and it needs evidence from the parties so that it can satisfy itself that the derogations won't lead to a risk of preemptive action. And, and this process is all set out in the CMA's guidance, which I will come to. Now, Facebook doesn't challenge the imposition of the IEO in the first place by the CMA, and the tribunal noted that. It was very clear in the proceedings below it wasn't challenging the imposition of the IEO, and you'll see that noted in various places in the tribunal judgment, but very clearly at paragraph 122. And it also doesn't challenge, and again, this is a point that the tribunal noted, uh, it also doesn't challenge the CMA's guidance, so the general process that it applies in the case of completed mergers. Now, in this case... So, so it could be said that um, Facebook knew, I mean, Facebook, large glo global corporation, knew precisely what it's doing when it undertakes a major merger. It knew very well what was going to happen if the CMA decided to call it in, effectively. In, indeed, and we say that, that the UK is relatively unusual in not having a mandatory pre-notification system. So it is permissible, and we don't criticise Facebook for not notifying the merger. That's a permissible feature of this system. But did, the did they tell any other competition authorities? Um, I meant to ask you about, or to ask about America particularly. Well, it, it, it was not subject to mandatory notification in any jurisdiction. Right. Um, as of today, I think the United States uh, is, still, is still looking at the transaction. There were proceedings in the United States. Which state? It's at a federal level. It's a federal one. Uh, and Australia. I'll uh, get back to you. Uh, sorry, is there an answer to that question? You don't know. Well, <coughs> it's not formal proceedings in the sense. Um, they've, they've issued questions, uh, civil questions to the demand. It wasn't as a result of not having been notified. In the US, they can choose to notify after the fact. I think uh, we'll get you 
Q-tip. Yes. Q-tip. And, and I think, my lord, about a month ago, there's been a jurisdictional uh, issue in Austria, which a year later has. Right. And in Australia, are there legal proceedings? I will, if you find, take instructions. Oh, we'll, instructions. we'll find out over time. Tell us tomorrow. Yeah. My lord, yes. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, my fault. No, no, of, of course. Um, I, I think what I was saying was that it's the, that you, uh, my lord put to me that Facebook would have known that this is the system. And uh, yes, I, I agree with that um, observation. And I also say that the necessary corollary of the system that we have, which allows parties to merge without pre notifying is that is that these um, protective me- measures have to be put in place. That's the quid pro quo, as it were, of having the system that we have. Now, in, in this case, at the very outset of the investigation, Facebook made five derogation requests to the CMA, and four of those were resolved. And these proceedings, of course, concern the, the fifth of them, which, as the court has seen, was very broad in nature. Um, Facebook sought a carve-out from certain paragraphs of the IEO of all of its business, though the request took a different pro- approach, and I'll come back to this, in respect to paragraphs 5D and 8D of the IEO, stating, uh, so Facebook stated in relation to those subparagraphs that they should apply to Facebook's business only insofar as that relates to the procurement or supply of gifts and stickers. So what was the response of the CMA to this broad request? The CMA did not refuse to grant the derogation request. As the tribunal noted and found, the CMA has always expected that derogations are likely to be appropriate in the case. The CMA's response was to ask Facebook to provide it with information and evidence to enable it, first of all, to understand the request and how it would work, And secondly, to consider whether or not the request, whether or not this broad carve-out as framed was appropriate. And that's precisely what is envisaged by the guidance in terms of process. And it was necessary because, as as I say, the CMA did not have very much information at all at that stage about Facebook's business. There's then, once the investigation starts, then of course the CMA has compulsory information gathering powers which it can use. But at this very early stage, it knows very, very little indeed. Now, Facebook's response to that was to refuse to provide any of the information, any of the information that the CMA sought. Effectively, what it did was it dug its heels in and it sought to characterize the issue of being one of principle. And what it said was that its business does not overlap horizontally with that of Giphy, and that also the most extreme thing that the CMA could do was to, to divest, to order divestment of Giphy at the end of the merger inquiry. And so in those circumstances, Facebook's position was that as a matter of principle, there was no need for it to provide any information. And as a matter of principle, it was unnecessary for the CMA to impose any IEO on Facebook's business. And so accordingly, Facebook's position was and continues to be that it was unlawful for the CMA to seek information. Uh, The only lawful cause, Facebook says, was for the CMA to grant its broad derogation request without obtaining information from Facebook. And in my submission, one only needs to state that proposition, which is what Facebook's case amounts to. One only needs to state it to see that it's incorrect, because what Facebook is asked, what, what Facebook asked the tribunal to find and what it's asking this court to find is that the only lawful response the CMA could have made once Facebook made its carve-out request was to grant it without seeking any further information from Facebook. That's what its case amounts to. And our position, the CMA's position, is that that is wrong. Indeed, we say, had the CMA taken that approach, had it simply accepted Facebook's assertions at face value it would have been in dereliction of its duties as the merger's authority. Because the stance of Facebook was effectively to try to require the CMA to accept Facebook's view of the merger. In other words, no horizontal overlap. Uh, uh, And the remedies that the CMA might impose. In other words, well, the worst remedy the CMA might impose is divestment of Giphy. Uh, At a point in time where the CMA simply didn't have the information it needed, it needed to form its own view on those matters. And that's why the tribunal was properly very careful not to make findings on those points, because those are precisely the types of points 
that are in an issue in the investigation. That's why we have a mergers investigation. Now, um, as it happens, the, the CMA has now made a reference, and that reference does find that there is a horizontal competition concern. Now, that's, of course, not strictly relevant to this appeal. In fact, it's not relevant to this appeal at all, because it postdates the relevant events. But what it does show is, is why the CMA acted reasonably at the time in not simply taking Facebook's word for it. It wanted to explore and examine the situation itself on the basis of evidence. Uh, and that, that's what's being criticized, essentially. And, uh, and um, there is really no basis at all for advancing that criticism. Um, the CAT, the tribunal, correctly identified these points. And I know the tribunal's read it, but it is a very neat encapsulation. If you wouldn't mind going back to paragraph 128 of the judgment, it's a very neat encapsulation of really what, what the actual issue is. Because there's a lot in my learned friend's case, um, in, in terms of his grounds of appeal, which is really uh, uh, seeking to attack straw men, which don't exist. But if you turn to, to paragraph 128 of the tribunal's judgment on page 142 of the bundle, you'll see the tribunal make these points. So the tribunal agrees with the CMA that it's not necessarily bound to accept assertions made by merging parties without further veri ver verification. There's an information asymmetry. It's important that both sides share a common understanding of what derogations are requested. And for this to happen, it's clear that an undertaking must engage with the CMA. It's not for an undertaking which is seeking the CMA's consent to a derogation request to say that the CMA should grant it on the basis of its own assertions and assurances that there are no anti-competitive concerns. On the contrary, the CMA is under a duty to acquaint itself with the relevant information, and BAA at paragraph 20, subparagraph 3, is cited. Mm. Um, and we'll, we'll come back to BAA in, in response to the last round of appeal. But then you see further down, um, merging entities seeking derogations are expected to engage with the CMA when seeking them. The lack of real and constructive engagement in this case by Facebook is not a constructive approach. It appears to the tribunal from the correspondence that the CMA was actively seeking further information from Facebook so that it could deal with the carve-out request properly. In cases where merging, merging entities seek derogations from an IEO, there's in invariably an element of give and take, and where appropriate, they're working out of the precise terms of the derogation. This did not occur in this case. And in my respect to submission, this really does encapsulate what the real issue is in this appeal, and it's a short point, and really our well, I answer... I that to Mr O'Donoghue at about 10.45 this morning. My, my Lord, you did, and, and, and we agree with respect. So we say, in a nutshell, that is our response to this appeal. That's what this case is about. That was the response of the tribunal to Facebook's challenge. Uh, the, the, the CMA really can't be criticised for doing its job and not taking Facebook's assertions at face value. Now, the, the point, uh, the, a point that the tribunal makes, perhaps if you've still got that open and could turn to um, paragraphs 159 and, six, and 60 at page 151 of the bundle... So at 159, the tribunal again is expressing its dissatisfaction with the way that Facebook hadn't sought to engage with the CMA and hadn't provided the CMA with information to ensure its requests were um, resolved. Sorry, I, I, I didn't catch the paragraph. I'm so sorry, one, 159 I'm on, 59, on page 159. Yeah, uh, and so, what, so the tribunal there is expressing really the same point. And it's saying that if Facebook was in fact unable to provide all the information, it should have made efforts to comply with the information request so far as it was possible to do so. But it simply didn't provide anything. That's that's the real that was the real vice here. And then at one at paragraph 160, this is in my my respectful submission an, an illuminating example of what went wrong because before the tribunal. One of the points that my learned friend made was, well, there are lots and lots, 250 or more Facebook subsidiaries, none of which have anything to do with this business, with these markets. And the CMA's response was, well, we've asked you about those subsidiaries, and you've never provided us with a list. That's part of the information we want. And the tribunal at that stage asked Facebook to provide it with a list, 
which it did, and that's the first time the CMA saw the list of subsidiaries. That's how in the dark the CMA was. And that's really because Facebook decided to stand on this so-called point of principle and not engage at all. That, that's, that's what went wrong. That's, that's what caused the stalemate, as the tribunal found. And in, in the light of some of the submissions that have been addressed to us today by Mr O'Donoghue, the last sentence of paragraph 160 is important as well, isn't it? It is not for the tribunal to assess or suggest whether the information is sufficient. That's quite right. At this stage, the CAT, and for that matter this court, is simply engaged in judicial review. That's right. Not in second-guessing the decisions of the decision-makers. My Lord, I agree. And this is not a case. It, It might be a different case. So had Facebook engaged with the information request, and come back and said, well, look, we've given you we've, we've given you the subsidiaries, we've explained exactly how everything works and operates and fits together. This is what we mean by gift-related business. Uh, had they done that, and the CMA said, well, I'm sorry, that's not enough, we need, and gone on with further and further more abstruse requests for information without taking a decision, we may be in a, it would be a totally different case, but that isn't what Facebook did. Well, it's then simply, there might be an issue, might there? about whether they acted rationally. There might be an issue as to whether they acted rationally. But that's not this case. What Facebook did in this case was simply, uh, as it were, got on its high horse and refused to cooperate at all. So um, with that introduction, I was going to turn to, that's really the gist of our submissions in a nutshell, but I want to turn to look at the statutory provisions, um, if I may. And um, if you could pick it up, please, at page... Um, 1112 of the bundle. It's behind tab 21 of the authorities. And it's, it's, it's the beginning of the excerpts that you've got from the Enterprise Act, and it's section 22. Because what I'd just like to do is put in context the provision that you have looked at, which is section 72. And what you see from section 22, which is headed duty to make references in relation to completed mergers. There's an an analogous duty for for, for mergers which are anticipated. Um, Is that the CMA shall, so there's a duty, shall, um, subject to subsections 2 and 3, make a reference to its chair for the constitution of a group under Schedule 4 of of the 2013 Act. If the CMA believes that it is or may be the case that a relevant merger situation has been created, and the creation of that situation has resulted or may be expected to result in a substantial lessening of competition within any, any market or markets in the United Kingdom. Now, just to locate when this arises in the procedure, this reference is what has just happened very recently. So this reference is at the end of phase one. Yes. So the phase one investigation is conducted in order to make this assessment whether the CMA believes it may be the case that there's a relevant merger situation and that that may result in an well, SMC. The explains all this in about uh, 10 paragraphs as to the phase one and phase two, the fact that the phase one and phase two nomenclature is not um, contained in the, in the statute, but it's, it's accepted as being the, yeah. the approach. That's right. Yeah. Um, and, but, but the point I'm going to make, so to, to, <coughs> to foreshadow the point I'm going to make, at this stage, so after phase one, the CMA has to have reached a view as to whether or not it, it may be the case that there is a substantial lessening of competition caused by the merger. So that's the view they've just reached. But at the beginning of phase one, when they have the power to impose the IEO, they do not have to have reached any view on whether or not there is potentially an SLC. And I'm going to come and show you that. But it's an important point, but it, because it goes to what exercise the CMA needs to be conducting when imposing the IEO. And when so what's the trigger for the IEO? So the trigger for the IEO is preemptive action. That's section 72, which I'm going to come to. But if you go, let's just look at it now. So um, if you turn up section 72... It's, it's the risk of preemptive action. Yes, yeah, so um, it's... So, so could you just look at page 1189, please, the beginning of section 72? So where the CMA is considering whether to make a reference, that's at any point at the be- from the beginning of phase one. Mm-hmm. And the CMA has reasonable grounds that, that to, for suspecting that it is or may be the case that two or more enterprises have ceased to be distinct. In other words, they've merged. Yep. Then 
you, you go over the page, it may, by order, for the purpose of preventing preemptive action, do all of these things. So, basically, to summarise, impose an IEO. And so, really, the important point that I'm drawing out here is that at this, at this early stage, all the CMA needs to be satisfied of is that there has actually been a merger. They don't even have to be satisfied that the jurisdictional tests are met. Still less do they have to be satisfied that this merger results in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an SLC. Still less do they have to know if there is an SLC, what type of SLC it is, in which markets. And, and still less do they have to know or predict what the remedy is at the end of this process. We're way behind, we're way before that stage. So it's not actually a risk of preemptive action, it's actually just reasonable grounds for, I mean, that it's considering reverence and the reasonable grounds for suspecting that it may be the case that two enterprises have ceased to be distinct or that two arrangements are in process for that purpose. Yes, and so, here, I mean, it's, 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 it's hardly a hurdle at all. It's hardly a hurdle at all. And, but the key point is that unlike the position at the end of phase one, when a reference is made, which we've seen from section 22, the CMA, it doesn't, it doesn't even need to be a twinkle in the CMA's eye as to the nature of the SLC or what remedies would be imposed. And so the idea that at that stage, the CMA is able to say, well, it's all right, because what we, might, what we could do at the end is, is order divestment of Giphy. Therefore, all we need to do in the IEO is, is, is um, protect Giphy's business. Simply not what the legislation contemplates. Now, the, the other point to make on the legislation is, there are a couple more points to make. If you could go back, please, to page 1135. This is section 35. So questions to be decided in relation to completed mergers. So this is phase two, what's called phase two, as the tribunal explains it. So you see, subject to subsection six and seven, the CMA shall, on a reference under section 22, decide the following questions. So whether a relevant merger situation has been created, and if so, whether it, um, whether, whether the creation of that situation has resulted or may be expected to result in a substantial lessening of competition within, within any market or markets in the United Kingdom for goods or services. And then you see it too, um, the meaning of anti-competitive out outcome, which is essentially if there is or may be expected to be an SLC as a result of the merger. And then you see at three, the CMA shall, so it's a duty, if it has decided that there's an anti-competitive outcome, decide the following questions. Whether action should be taken by it under section 41.2 for the purpose of remedying, mitigating or preventing the SLC or any adverse effect which has resulted from it. So it's very broad. It's not just targeting the substantial lessening of competition that's been identified at that stage, but also any adverse effect resulting from the substantial lessening of competition. And then you see at little c, and in either case, what action should be taken. And then at four, in deciding the questions mentioned in subsection three, the CMA shall in particular have regard that to the need to, to achieve as comprehensive a solution as is reasonable and practicable to the substantial lessening of competition and any adverse effects resulting from it. And so it's a very comprehensive duty, not a power, a duty on the CMA at the end of the process if it's identified an SLC. And really the importance, why that's important, is because what the IEO is doing, the, the, the IEO power is doing, is keeping all of that open, just ensuring that this reference has teeth, that it's not preempted or rendered pointless by action that might be taken, taken in the meantime. So, so the answer to the um, rhetorical question posed uh, by Mr O'Donoghue, which was, well, all you've ever said is you're going to, you've never been able to give an example of what you might do uh, that is other than a divestiture of Giphy or Giphy related. The answer is in section 35.3a, uh, which says you can take action for the purpose of remedying, mitigating, or preventing the substantial lessening of competition or any adverse effect resulting therefrom. My Lord, yes, that's, that's part of the answer. Um, 
Uh, I'm told that the transcriber is finding the audio quality poor and has asked us to raise it with the court. I'm not sure what I can do because if I, I don't know if that's the audio. We can talk more clearly. I, I will do my best. I don't think you need to talk more clearly. I think I mean, if there's an issue with the teams, teams. I mean, if if switching teams off would improve the transcription, then I think we should we just have to switch teams out. I think so. Yeah. I thought the transcription has been done over to you. I'm yeah, probably sure. probably the transcription is being done on the live stream. Is it? No, the transcription is being done on teams. On teams. Uh, I think the problem is that if I switch my if I unmute myself, there's feedback which is impossible, and so I'm not sure there's any way. Around it, I've turned all my volume down. But if I, I'm, I'm unmuting myself. Oh, maybe it's okay. I, I think just... we'll just have to live with it. Okay. Um, I've, I've unmuted myself. If there is feedback, can you let me know, and I'll switch it off again. We will. Thank you. Um, so, my lord, yes, that's partly that's partly the answer to the question is is the breadth of subsection three. So Mr. we're back to Mr. O'Donoghue saying, what, why haven't we given examples? I could give hypothetical examples. I'm happy to do so if that's a fruitful way forward. But really the answer is partly the breadth of the, the remedial options at the end of the process, which are not only tackling the SLC, but any adverse effects from it. And the next thing I'm going to show you is how broad the remedial options are for the CMA. And partly the point I made about the distinction between the CMA's, what the CMA is required to do at the initial stage when it's thinking of imposing an initial enforcement order, which is at a very, very low threshold, um, and what it's required to do at the end of phase one, which is actually identify at that stage whether or not it, they, they think there might be an SLC. So it's not required to do that at the beginning, because that's the purpose of phase one, is to get to that point. And so really, the, the CMA, it wasn't incumbent on the CMA at the beginning of this process, which is the point in time that the tribunal was examining, to hypothesize about what the SLCs might be, what remedies the CMA might impose, because it was too early. At, not only was it too early, the statute purposefully does not require the CMA to do that. So yeah, my Lord's turning to... There may to still be an issue with the transcription. There's a lot of um, toing and froing behind you, Mr. Dimitri, which you aren't aware of. It's, oh, it's okay now. It's okay. It's so right, okay. Thank you. Um, you it, it, we, it, where do we go from section 35? So now, section from section 31. 35, could we go to section 41, which 41, is on page 1143? Um, yeah. This is the duty to remedy effects of completed or anticipated mergers. And you saw reference to that in section 35. And so subsection 2 applies where a report has been prepared and published. That's a report at the end of phase 2. Um, and then you see at 2, the CMA shall take such action under section 82 or 84 as it considers to be reasonable and practicable. So re you see the same language. I'm not going to read it out, but the same language. And you see at subsection four, again, the same language about the need to achieve a co as comprehensive a solution as is reasonable. And then the next um, section we want to go to is section 84 on page 1206. So you see section 84 was referred to in subsection two of section 41. And just to trace it through, on page 1206. Just give me the page number again. 1206, my lord. Thank you. Final orders, the CMA may, in accordance with section 41, make an order under this section. An order under this section may contain anything permitted by Schedule 8, so I'm going to come to Schedule 8 next, and such supplementary, consequential or incidental provision as the CMA considers appropriate. Mm -hmm. So the final point on the statute is Schedule 8, and the point that I want to make about Schedule 8 is that it contains an extremely broad array of potential remedial options for the CMA. So it's on page 1268, that's where it starts. And so you see um, at paragraph 2, an order may prohibit the making or performance of any agreement or require a party to terminate an agreement. And just, just pausing for a moment, nowhere in Schedule 8 is a distinction drawn between the acquiring business and the target business. 
Uh, and so, really, this is a key answer to Mr. O'Donoghue's point, which is that you need to see it all through the lens of divestment of the target business, because that is completely inconsistent with the statute, which doesn't make that distinction, and which contains a much wider array of potential uh, remedies. But, of course, what, what he says is this is an exceptional case because Facebook is such a large global corporation. And I think he says you ought to have realized that right at the outset, that this was a shark eating a minnow, um, probably an inappropriate um, metaphor, uh, and therefore you couldn't um, stop the shark going about its lawful business um, just because it had eaten a minnow. Um, in the normal case, it may be that acquirer and acquired are either of comparable size or comparable power, but the market power here was all with Facebook. Facebook has a vast business globally, every country in the world, etc., etc., and uh, millions of employees. Millions is exaggerated, but fifty thousand plus. And really, this was overkill, and you should have seen that. And my lord, the answer to that really is threefold. And and forgive me for extending the marine analogies beyond sharks, but it's really the tentacle point. So. Um, so it's not. It's not. It's an octopus. It's an octopus, know. and so, so the first answer is is the tentacle point, which is that the CMA needed to work out exactly how these businesses interacted, and so that that's why we come back again to the point I made at the outset in paragraph 128 of the tribunal's judgment, which is that it wasn't the CMA was not obliged to take that, to to, to, to essentially take the assertions made by Facebook on those matters at face value. Um, it, its role, its duty, was to investigate it itself. So that's the first point. The second point is that these are nascent markets, and all of these tech, tech industries are uh, moving very, very quickly. And the, the effect of mergers and the, the competitive states of these markets are quite, they're quite complicated matters, which are really for the competition authority to investigate. And again, it's not strictly relevant to this appeal, but at the end of phase one, one of the theories of harm, one of the, one of the possible SLCs that the CMA has identified is in um, loss of potential competition in display advertising. And so there, the CMA has found that there may well be a horizontal competitive relationship between Facebook and Giphy in effectively using GIFs and stickers and perhaps emojis or other ways of, of, of advertising through messaging. This is all fast-moving stuff. Uh, and that's why it's not an answer to say, well, there's 99% and 1%, because it's just much more complicated and the CMA needs to examine it and reach a view. And the third point, of course, is the one I've already made, which is that, um, that, that really that... Mr. O'Donoghue's point doesn't have any force in circumstances where they simply didn't provide any of the information required. So had they provided a chunk of information to make good their case, and the CMA had, uh, had, had effectively ignored it or not engaged with it properly, that would have, they, they may well have had a rationality challenge, but that isn't this case. I was particularly saying when the, the challenge, that challenge might have been directed at the IEO itself. Yes. But in circumstances where it wasn't, and subsequently was not pursued, to then effectively challenge it by the back door by saying that without providing with any information, you should now disapply it, seems to me to be very difficult. My Lord, I respectfully agree, and no doubt the reason why oh. Facebook didn't challenge the IEO itself or the guidance, which we'll come to, it is because it recognises that at the very outset, the CMA simply doesn't have any information. And, it, well, that, and that's, that's the answer to that point. I mean, your, of your three point? points, yes. your first point in particular, answers any criticism that was levelled against the IEO. Yes. Unless and until you actually had um, some information as to how these businesses inter interacted. You're, um, as, as the um, relevant authority, you were actually obliged to. Uh, put into pl put in place a broad IEO. Yes. So it's to hold the ring. My lord, that's exactly that's exactly our answer. Um, uh, just finishing up on the statute, if I may. So um, going back to page one two six nine, I just want to show you some of the other things that the CMA can do. 
So at three, and, and just cast your eye down the list, an order may prohibit the withholding from any person of any goods or services. Um, you can see at four that they can impose conditions of the supply of goods or services to any person buying them. Five, prohibiting discrimination between persons in the prices charged for goods or services. Um, I, I don't need to read them all out, but you get the picture. Can you turn to 10, which is on page 1272? Because this really is a point relevant to the sticker library example that my Lord the Master of the Rolls put to my learned friend. Because at 10, an order may require a person to supply goods or services or to do anything which the relevant authority considers appropriate to facilitate the provision of goods or, of serv or services. So a final order could require Facebook to, to, to provide certain goods or services. And so it's simply not right for my learned friend to say that, um, that, that the... Um, rem remedial options are limited, and it's 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 against that. Sort of well, twelve is factor. quite twelve is quite a relevant one as well, isn't it? Because twelve really is more likely to be. I mean, it doesn't say so, but it's more likely to be directed at the acquiring business, and if, in effect, saying, "Well, okay, you can do this, but you can't go beyond acquiring Giffy's business and try and try, for example, to acquire Tenor's business." My Lord, yes, and and just just going, just thinking a little bit more about the the potential substantial lessening of competition that the CMA has provisionally identified in its Phase One report in its reference. One can imagine a situation. So what what it's found, the CMA, is that before the merger, Giffy had plans to start monetizing its gifts, to start using its gifts as a vehicle for advertising in message in messages. Now. Let's say that, um, let's say that, that, I don't know if this is true or not, I'm just giving a hypothetical, hypothetical example, but let's say that Facebook had been developing a product to compete with that. And let's say that they're not GIFs that it's using, but something else that doesn't come within the definition of GIFs, maybe some sort of emoji that has a, an advertising message in it. And then let's say that um, Facebook decide, decides after the merger to abandon all of that work. Well, that's plainly a lack. That's re that's resulting in less competition in the marketplace, and that's something which, um, looking at the at the final orders, is something that could be tackled. You look at paragraph ten, and looking at the template IEO, mm. you can see is something which is targeted by the template IEO. So it's saying, well, what you can't do is disband teams that are dealing with a certain product line. Um, you can't dispose of assets that you've acquired for, for a certain product line without, of course, asking for permission from the CMA. And so it's preserving the competition that existed pre-merger. I'm not putting that forward as a, as a real example. I simply don't know. I'm not close enough to the facts. But it's, it's an example which one can readily envisage, which has some basis in, 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 in the, the SLC that the CMA has identified provisionally. And then just to finish on this, you see at paragraph 13 is divestment. So an order may provide for the division of any business, whether by sale of any part of the undertaking or assets or otherwise, and the division of any groups um, of interconnected bodies corporate. And again, the point I made at the outset is that none of these provisions distinguish between the acquirer and the acquired. So these, these, these are all powers that the CMA has at its disposal when it's considering its statutory duties under the provisions that I've shown you. Now, um, before we leave, let me see if I've said everything I wanted to say about section 72. Um, perhaps we could just turn that up at page 1189 because I skirted over this a little bit. So, um, I think the court already has the point. I've made it about the low threshold, and you've seen, I don't think I need to take you back to Stericycle and the case law, which the tribunal refers to, as to the precautionary nature of this power. Um, it's in the tribunal's judgment at paragraph 15 for your notes. Um, the point I did want to make is that this as, as I think uh, my Lord the Chancellor um, identified in an exchange with my learned friend, that, that this 
version of Section 72 as a result of legislative reform. And we can take this point from the CAT judgment. Um, in, in fact, so that you're not moving around, can I just, before doing that, sorry to, sorry to stop my flow, but um, just on section 72, can I just pick up a couple more points? So we've looked at subsection 2 and the, 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 the low threshold. Um, subsection 3C is, of course, a person may, with the consent of the CMA, take action which would otherwise constitute a contra contravention of an order. And then at 7, you've got the provision about reason... Uh, CMA shall, as soon as reasonably practical, consider any representations received um, in relation to varying or revoking an order under this section. So the whole legislative scheme is set up to do this, but for, for a precautionary approach to be adopted at the outset, and then as soon as reasonably practicable, to cut back on the wide precautionary approach. And that, in a nutshell, as I've said, is what the, the CMA was striving to do, but couldn't do, because it came up against the intransigence of, of Facebook. Has there ever been any other case where a similar challenge has been made to the information sought by the CMA? I don't think there has. I think in most cases there's, there's give and take and cooperation, but I, I, I need to check before answering that question. Check overnight. Um, and you see, as you've seen lots of times, of course, the definition in, in subsection 8, which um, I'll come back to under ground 1. Um, so back to legislative reform, and I was going to take this from the tribunal judgment, where it's set out very clearly. So that's at page 88 of the bundle, behind tab 6 in the core bundle. And it's paragraphs 10 and 11. And the, the tribunal at paragraph 10 explains what the key changes were. And you see in the citation, the inset, really what the main change, the, mo the, mo the most relevant change was. So um, it, it used to be the case that, that, that the Act said that no order shall be made um, unless the OFT has reasonable grounds for suspecting that it is or may be the case that a relevant merger situation has been created and preemptive action is in progress or in contemplation. So they had to be satisfied that there was actually preemptive action going to happen. And you can see, and in, in fact, the other thing that's changed, but it's not materially relevant, is the relevant merger situation has been created. So now all that has to, that there just has to have been a, a merger in the sense of undertakings not being distinct. But the jurisdictional threshold doesn't have to be met. So the CMA doesn't have to satisfy itself with that. So it's been lowered um, in those two respects, the threshold. And you can see um, that stated by the tribunal at, in paragraph 11. Um, and then the explanatory notes, which you've got in the bundle, but really this is the relevant bit, so it's more efficient to take it from here. So the explanatory notes explain this, this section strengthens, this is paragraph 12, um, strengthens the interim measures powers available to the CMA by making it easier for the CMA to suspend the integration of companies involved in a, in a merger during a phase one investigation. It's intended to provide a solution to the current difficulties that the OFT and CC face in reviewing and dealing with the effects of completed mergers. Um, this section changes the mechanism through at which phase one the CMA can prevent preemptive action from taking place in completed and anticipated mergers. At the moment, in completed mergers, merging parties are often unwilling to sign up to initial undertakings until they've agreed with the OFT derogations from its standard template undertakings. This process can take time and integration can continue until undertakings are in place. This section enables the CMA to pause integration of companies involved in a merger immediately and then consider with the parties whether any further integration should be allowed through derogations. And so the changes are precisely to enable this process to happen. Well, I mean, uh, Mr. O'Donoghue would say, ah, oh, well, that's all about integration, and we're quite willing to accept a lack of integration and measures to protect it against integration. You want to go further. And that's not in the guidance, he says. Well, I can't take any more from this than is there, and I'm no. not seeking to say... I mean, it, plainly, the Act is more than about integration, because Section 72 it is much 
broader than that. So Schedulate. Schedulate. Mm. So it's plainly about more than integration, if what's meant by integration is the merging, to the, 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 the two becoming one, as it were. But if what's meant is acts taken as a result of integration, as a result of the merger, then, then yes, that, that, is, I would, that, that is what this is all about. So um, it's no part of the CMA's case, and it never has been any part of our case, that the CMA has some kind of roving market supervisory role and that it can step in and, and cure market deficiencies in these markets. It has to be. I mean, I may be taking this a bit out of course, but I wanted to ask you tonight rather than in the morning to give you a chance to think about it. One analysis here of paragraph 124 of the tribunal's judgment is that um, the, the words in the sentence complained of, if I can put it that way, um, were too broad. And that's where Mr. O'Donoghue says in his supplementary skeleton to the CMA, we've got you here, you've admitted it, uh, you know, uh, and all that um, somewhat flourishing submission. And, and I just wanted to ask you whether you say um, on mature consideration uh, that the um, tribunal was absolutely right in 124 or whether you say that um, the, the formulation would benefit from either amendment or addition to clarify the point you're just making which is that it is about integration of one business with another and not about businesses that are entirely separate from that integration. My Lord, um, I, I think uh, my answer in a nutshell, and I'll come back to the wording, if I may, of paragraph 124, but my response to that in a nutshell is that Mr O'Donoghue's taken paragraph 124 and that sentence in isolation, and that when one looks at other paragraphs in the judgment, it's absolutely clear that the tribunal had in mind that one, one, is, one is looking at preemptive action caused by the merger, related I, to I, merger. I, I get that. Um, in, in the market in question. In, in the market, in qu or potential markets in question, yeah, because yeah. the CMA may not know at that stage which yeah. markets are affected. Yeah. I mean, I completely get that. Um, and and I'm, I'm sure you're right, and my analysis, such as I've had time to do, is, is the same. But nonetheless, I still pose the question I did, because um, obviously I need to have your his submissions and your submissions clearly in mind about what precisely, um, because if we're going to say what a preemptive action means, then we'd like to do so with the benefit of full submissions and clear submissions. And if you were to say, well, it's clear from other parts of the judgment, but it's not totally clear from one, two, four, for my part, I'd rather you said that for, for the benefit of future um, people looking at this case, because. Um, if, if it's right that there's never been a case in many, many years um, like this, then there may not be another one for many, many years. And so um, I, I'd like to get it right if we can. And I'd like your considered, I'd like CMA's considered approach so that we can consider both sides of this argument and you know, decide what we should say. My Lord, I understand. And I, I will um, consult with my clients and come back with our considered position yeah. tomorrow on, on the wording. I mean, we are very conscious, as you've heard from my Lord the Chancellor, uh, that you, you are the decision maker in this. Yes. Um, and and we, we, I mean, for my, speaking only for myself, this court does not wish to put itself in the position of the decision maker. We're very happy for the CMA to do its job. But obviously, um, Mr. O'Donoghue is right. The CMA must do its job according to law. Of course. Yes. And if there's clarity to be given, then I um, agree with my lord that it would be sensible if we, we did it on the basis of fully reasoned submission. But if you think about that overnight, then. My lord, I, my lord, I will. Um, I, I will. All I'd like to say now, um, but I will come back tomorrow and give you considered submissions, having mm, yeah, no, reflected with my client. But. All I'd like to say now is that, that what the tribunal was doing was accepting a submission that, that we made. And the submission that we made was that if one, if, if on one reading, if one of, of subsection 8, if one is focusing solely on the remedies that might be imposed at the end, and really this is the point that my Lord's put to my learned friend in argument, one is missing out on harm that may be caused by the merger during the course of the reference that then proves to be irremediable at the end. 
So that was the submission that I made, and it was accepted. And I, I very much think that that's what the tribunal was proposing yeah. to say. But I, I will come back and give you my submissions on the wording of yeah. paragraph one, two, four. I mean, one is put in mind of what might be the elephant in the room here. Um, if the submission is right, that, well, this is a very small business, we're a very big enterprise, um, one does have to ask the question, well, if it's so unimportant, why all the fuss? Um, um, and um, it, it does seem that even if 1%, I mean, I didn't put this to Mr. O'Donoghue, but he can deal with it in reply, even if only 1% of users of WhatsApp now use GIFs, um, if one has seen, if I can use an analogy, the use of emojis go from nothing to almost ubiquitous use, even I suspect by judges, um, uh, in private, some judges. Um, <laughs> and, and GIF may go the same way, and that may be what the fuss is about. GIF, GIFs are um, obviously attractive to yeah. perhaps at the moment younger users, but they may become attractive to older users as they get with the program. My Lord, yes, and as my son would say. Um, yes to all of that. <laughs> yes to all of that. And that's really what I had in mind when I said um, a few minutes ago that these are sort of nascent, developing, fast developing markets, and yes. that's why the competition authority needs to tread very carefully. They're very yes. fast developing. Well, I mean, the Facebook par excellence is... Uh, as you say, at the forefront of these fast developing markets, probably yeah. the probably leading um, those markets. Yeah. yeah. My lord. Um, so I um, was going to take you next to the interim measures guidance. Yes. Um, which is behind tab twenty four of the authorities, page one three five four. Starts at 1350. Um, but if you could turn to 1354, you can see you'll see a heading. So this is the interim measures guidance. So it's all about interim measures and merger investigations. And again, I've already made the point, the tribunal noted, that none of this is challenged by Facebook. And you see at paragraph 1.6, the point made. Um, about the ex ante nature of merger control and given it's essential to the functioning of the UK's voluntary non-suspensory merger regime that interim measures preserve the pre-merger competitive structure that, that, that interim measures to preserve the pre-merger competitive structure of markets should be effective effective um, and so I'm so sorry footnote 8 I've been asked to read see the discussion of this issue in C France. Uh, just to be clear on C France, so again, this is another straw man in my learned friend's submissions where he's attacking a straw man. We only cited C France for the very obvious proposition that, that, that this is merger control is ex ante regulatory control, nothing more than that. We weren't, certainly weren't seeking to read into the ratio some, some, um, some principles. Do, do we have to use ex ante the whole time? This no. is, seems to be a competition lawyer's obsession. What's wrong with perspective? Perspective, much better. I'm happy with that. Some words don't. don't think I did use it. Some words don't translate properly from the Latin, but I think it can. I think it does too. I mean, it's it's it's. I always have to think twice about ex ante for some reason, but and I what don't. Would, what would we say for ex post after the event? Well, probably we would after the event. Yeah, after yeah. the event. But prospective, at least for this one, because very we're happy with prospective. Lovely. So. Um, <laughs> Then, if you could Got that off my chest, Miss. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Um, if you could then move on to page 1363. Um, and again, so you see a heading there, Interim Measures in Completed Mergers. And you see there um, that they serve a particularly important function where the merger is completed before it's examined by the CMA. It, at phase one, an IEO has a proportionary purpose. And therefore, the CMA would normally impose an IEO in completed merger cases, which is investigating given the immediate risk of preemptive action, because by definition, they've, they've merged. 
Um, and then you see some exceptions, the only exceptions to this. Um, and then at, uh, so in other words, um, you can see from that that there is, there is almost by definition a risk of preemptive action because the merge has taken place. Um, and then moving on to page 1364, um, at 2.29, uh, given the need to impose an IEO quickly in completed mergers, any IEO imposed in these circumstances will almost always take the form of the standard template available on the CMA's website. And then you see discussions over scope will therefore almost always take the form of derogations, which the CMA may grant simultaneously with the IEO or after the IEO is imposed, rather than amendments to the standard form. This approach is intended to ensure that effective IEOs can be put in place as quickly as possible and to provide greater factual and legal certainty around the initial scope of an IEO. So again, um, I'm repeating myself, but that's what the CMA proposed and intended to do, and the, the tribunal, tribunal found that. Um, and then you see at 2.30 um, the, the reference to the importance of evidence. So in completed merger cases, where practicable, the CMA will consider submissions on derogations from the merging parties before imposing an IEO, and merging parties are encouraged to engage with the CMA as early as possible for this process. And then at the end of the paragraph, um, you see the CMA encourages merging parties to provide fully specified reasoned and evidence submissions to facilitate early discussions if the merging parties consider it necessary to have derogations in place on completion. So this is all envisaged by the guidance, which is not under challenge. And you can see the link here in this paragraph between the, the quality of evidence, so provide us very full evidence, and then we can get on with it quickly, and the speed with which the CMA would then act. And th this is, a, as I say, is because it's a very early stage, and the CMA doesn't have evidence at that stage. Um, moving on to 1366, again, uh, 3.2, merging parties should engage early to discuss derogation requests. They're more likely to be granted if requests are fully specified, reasoned, and supported by relevant evidence including, for example, and there's, there's an example of what the CMA would like to see. Then 3.5 on page 1368, everybody's told that where the CMA's fact-finding remains at an early stage, i.e. particularly within phase one, and of course here we're at the start of phase one, the CMA is likely to adopt a cautious approach to granting derogations, typically granting narrow derogations that are closely calibrated, the involvement of a monitoring trustee may enable the CMA to grant more complex derogations as well as speed up the CMA's decision. Um, 3.8 on the same page, uh, encouraging parties to make submissions. And then 1372, um, paragraph 3.22, um, you, you probably saw that the standard form interim the standard form um, order allows without the need for a derogation action taken in the ordinary course of business and so it, it's, it's a very exaggerated submission for my learned friend to make that everything is frozen because actions that are taken in the ordinary course of business can, can, can continue to go ahead and are not, not, um, not part of the IO. Then which would include, presumably, hiring and firing of key staff who had nothing whatsoever to do with... But once the CMA, my Lord, once the CMA had, once, once it has been given sufficient information to satisfy itself that these staff don't have anything to do with, can't be involved in preemptive action, then, then yes. I see my Lord look, looking at the clock. Is that a convenient moment? Well, I, mean, I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> I It just caused me to look at the clock. That's why I mentioned it. But is this, yeah. is um, this a convenient moment, or do you want me to press on? I, I know, know it's a convenient uh, moment. I'll just make a note. I, I've got a few more points to make on the guidance, um, or a few more paragraphs to draw to your attention. Well, are you in good time? Uh, I'm in good time. Um, I, I mean, you, you, you will need to make sure you leave Mr. Ogon if you have enough time to, to deal with the points and having perhaps considered what we've said over the course of the day. Yes. I want him to have a full opportunity to reply. My Lord, yes. Well, we've, we've agreed. I, I started later than we'd agreed, which I'm not complaining about, but we've agreed that I have till 12.15, which would give him 45 minutes. Right. Try and make it 12 if you can. 
My Lord, I'll, I will. Um, I mean, uh, you know, I think we've read everything you've put in. We've read everything both of you have put in, and quite a lot more besides. So if you can give them an hour. I will. And that would be useful to us. Very good. Well, thank you both, and we'll uh, resume at 10.30 tomorrow.